times you cry till the tears fall like rain. You try to overcome failing time and time again. But friend, don't be discouraged. Just hold your head up high for the only time is the last time you try for it's under the blood you'll get over the storm keep fighting the battle till you For it's under the blood You'll get over the storm Sometimes you hurt From the guilt of yesterday You try to forget But the memory Jesus forgives you and forgets your sin, then forgive yourself, put your trust in him. Well, we're not going to take a break tonight. It's too difficult. There's people everywhere. And, uh, but we are going to stand. We are going to stand. <laughs> but when are we going to stand? Charity, I would like for you to, brother, if you'd come sit next to Charles, uh, brother John Kilpatrick and Charity, if you'd sit next to Dick Rubin. In a few minutes, Charity is going to be singing Run to the Mercy Seat. And those of you that need the Lord to forgive you to wash your sins away, it's going to be your time to come. Now, I believe in altar calls. I read a story one time about, um, this happened on October the 8th, 1871. Remain standing just for a minute. It's good for your blood system. October the 8th, 1871, D.L. Moody preached to the largest congregation ever assembled in his tabernacle in Chicago. And his text was Matthew 27, 22. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And I know many of us have preached on that, pastors. 
What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And the people in that Chicago tabernacle hung on every word. Upon the conclusion, he said, I want you to take this text home with you tonight and turn it over in your minds during the upcoming week. And next Sunday, we will come to Calvary and the cross and we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. Ira Sankey began to sing, Today the Savior calls for refuge fly, the storms of justice falls, and death is nigh. And then they close the service. And I'm warning pastors, don't let this happen to you. That night, they dismissed the church. The great Chicago fire broke out that night, leaving the city of Chicago in ruins. To his dying day, he lived in total regret, regret of not having called the people to repentance. Later he said, I would rather have my right hand cut off than to give a congregation a week to decide on what they were going to do with Jesus. So I'm not going to give you a week. I'm not even going to give you an hour. You're going to make a decision tonight. Will you or will you not follow the Lord? It's going to be up to you to make that decision. Another thing I believe in, friends, is sudden conversion. I believe that a man can hear the word. I believe he can respond to the word. I believe he can walk the aisles. And I believe whether he cries or not is not the indicator of true salvation. Trust me, I've studied weeping, and pastors, you know it's true. I love tears of repentance, but that is not the only sign of a man's salvation. I believe a man can decide tonight, I will follow the Lord all the days of my life, come forward, give his heart to God, and live forever with Jesus. It's happened to thousands of people in this place, so tonight you're going to have that opportunity. I am speaking to a lot of backsliders also in this room. There's a lot of pastors, ministers of music, youth pastors, You've slidden away from God and you know it. You've come to this revival meeting. God has blessed you. God has touched you. But the work is not finished. I love you dearly. But I'd be doing my Lord a disservice. I would be held accountable on Judgment Day if I did not speak to you plainly. Some of you have lost your spiritual appetite. That is a sign of a backslidden condition. You remember back when you hungered and thirsted after the things of God, but that's grown cold now. You have grown more worldly in your actions and your desires. You remember back when all you desired was God's will. You were consumed with Jesus and his plan for your life, but that has changed. Other things have crept in. And be honest tonight, would you? And say, yeah, man. They have. They've slipped into my life. Other things are more important. I travel as an evangelist, Pastor, and I can tell within a half hour whether a pastor is living for God or not, and I'm not a judge. But I see what motivates the man. When I go visit a church, the first thing I tell him is no meals. If we're going to have a revival meeting, a series of meetings, I don't want any meals. I don't want anything to be done around fellowship. If we fellowship, we're going street evangelizing. And I can tell immediately whether or not a pastor is into souls, into the church, into anything. One pastor said, but Brother Steve, man, I've got a fishing trip planned tomorrow. I've got golfing planned the next day. I've got the, we've got stuff planned for you, brother. You can feel where a man's at, and I'm not against any of that, friend. But they called me there to hold a revival. So you've grown more worldly in your actions and your desires. And another point, and I'm going to let you sit in just a minute, another point to check. This is just a, a, a litmus test to see if you're in a backslidden condition. Is you have become less troubled about sin. The little things used to bother you, but they don't bother you anymore. You remember back when you were in Bible school or when you first got saved, God dealt mightily with you about little things, but now you allow things to come in your eyes and in your ears that you would never allow years ago. You are backslid. 
You're moving away from God. I don't want you to raise your hands, but some of you in this room and in the chapel listening to me, and when you, you go to a video store, video store to check out a video, you are pulled towards the PG-13 films. You don't want to watch a G. Why? Because it's clean. It's too clean for you. You want something with bite. You want something where there's going to be a little bit of something in there. You want to go right up to the edge. And you know with a PG-13, you're right there where the family can sort of watch it. You can sort of watch it. And years ago, you would have never touched anything like that. But you are backslid today. You have crept into that arena. And you are allowing things to come in your ears, your eyes. Don't come here like Simon the sorcerer looking for the anointing. Deal with that first, friend. Come to God and repent and say, Jesus, wash me. Wash me. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Hallelujah. Friends, I want revival in this country bad, but when, 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 when revival comes to your church, you better be ready and you better be holy. I'm talking holy because they're watching you. Pastors, look at me, man. They're watching you. By the way, Pastor John Kilpatrick can hear every word that's going on in this meeting. He's praying. He told me in just a minute, he said, Steve, the power of God has come all over me, but I'm interceding for you all the way through this meeting. All heaven's going to come down in just a minute, friend. Some of you are fighting hell. Satan is going to turn to you, some of you ministers, and say, you don't need to respond to that man. This is a pastor's conference. You don't need to respond to him. You think that's God speaking to you? There's only two voices out there, Fred. It's one or the other. Think God's telling you, you don't need to draw close to me. You don't need to deal with that sin. That's Satan telling you that. That's why pastor's going to be interceding for us. And he's, he's believing God tonight to touch your life, along with a lot of other intercessors that are praying right now. But I'm concerned, friends, because I want revival to hit this country. But this revival here has been noted for holiness. Holiness. People are getting holy. Parents are coming up to me. You know, parents are getting on edge because their kids are getting holy. <laughs> you know, when your kids come home and they don't cuss no more and they say, praise the Lord, mama. You know, or when your kids never did really cuss but they get home and they don't want the tube anymore. They don't want to watch the operas anymore. They don't want to watch this or that. They want to read the Bible. And they ask if they can pray around the table. And you're used to rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. And they sit down and they go, Jesus, get a hold of Daddy. Get a hold of Mama. Get a hold of Brother. Get a hold of Sister. I had one parent, set of parents come up to me and they said, Dear God, you changed my family, man. My kids are changed. You can tell it when they're at home. You know your kids. Hallelujah. Boy, he's here. Folks in the chapel, we're going to do something very unusual in just a minute. This is going to be difficult logistically, but I'm going to preach for a few minutes and then I'm going to give an altar call. And ushers, you're going to help me. I'll tell you when. We're taking everyone that's over there. We're going to open these doors here. No one's going to tell the fire marshal. We're going to open all these doors and I want everyone to be here. In a few minutes also, the youth are going to be letting out. There's four or five hundred young people back there. They're going to be coming in. By the way, if you want prayer tonight, get prayer. Don't, none of this, okay? Some of you are going to wait to the last minute to get prayer. I want to tell you, there's about a thousand other people hanging around this building who want to get in here bad. Okay? So if you're just going to sit back and go, well, you know, I'm going to wait for Brother Steve to get a word from God and walk over to me and pray for me. You know? We have people like that. They'll sit right where you're at and they'll sit in the chair. They go, God, speak to him. Speak to him about the woman with the red dress on, with her hair in a ponytail, that needs a touch. Needs a touch. You sit there and, friend... That's not what these meetings are all about. I love you dearly, but if you want prayer, step out. Get prayer. Pray this prayer with me right now. Everyone pray it in the chapel, at home. If you're listening in your car, we're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives right now. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name, 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Pastors, another thing I'd like to share with you, if you if revival, when it breaks out in your church, if you do have a special speaker come in, you tell that speaker that his time is limited behind the pulpit. Don't you let him just say, well, just go on and on. Brother, he'll kill him. Okay? Always remember, there are folks that are in that meeting, they're, and they're here tonight by a thread. They're here by a thread. They barely got in, friend. Somebody drugged them in. They're not here to hear two and a half hours of teaching. They're here to hear. They can't handle that. Most of us can't handle that, period. But they're not here. They're here for the very first time in your church. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear it clear. They need to understand it. Then you need to give them the opportunity to respond, and that's what I'm going to be doing tonight. By the way, I want to share something wonderful with everybody. Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. Those of you that are visiting for the first time, look at me, man. God Almighty loves you. He's here. You said, God, if you're out there, touch my life. Well, he's going to try to tonight, friend. He's going to touch your life, but you've just got to respond to him. I preached the other night on uh, you be good to God, God will be good to you. You know, you bless God, he'll bless you. You go after God, he'll go after you. You draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. All the promises in the Bible have conditions. If my people will humble the sons and pray and repent, well, only he'll heal our land. But there are conditions. And I read the scripture about do unto others as we'd have them do unto you. You know, the, the, the golden rule. And I've never thought about it before, but you know, that applies to God. Do unto God as you would have him do unto you. Why don't you love on him for a while? Friend, you want God to bless you. You want him to touch you. When was the last time you touched him? When was the last time you blessed him? When was the last time you woke up in the morning and you said, thank you that you woke up? That you woke up? You're breathing. When was the last time you stopped and said, thank you, Lord, for my fingers, my fingernails, my hair, my eyes, my ears. Thank you, Lord. Try blessing the Lord. Do unto him as you would have him do unto you. You want the Lord to listen to you? For the next few minutes, you listen to him. Psalm chapter 50. Would you turn there with me? Psalm chapter 50. I'm going to turn to two portions of scripture tonight. Boy, he's here. Pastors, I love you, man. I welcome you. Those of you that purchased the tape series, Hot from the Preacher's Mound, we just put that together before this, seri this, before this um, meeting, and we did not have the time to clean up some of those tapes. Some of them are crystal clear. Others are rough, but the message is there, okay? How many will listen to it anyhow if you purchased it? It's, it's, some of it, you just work through it, and once the, the volume will get right. Some of those, those are earlier sermons that we preached, and we had no idea what was going to be going on with this revival. And we, some of the tapes were poor quality, but we're doing the very best we can. But I, wanna, I appreciate you purchasing that set of tapes. A lot of folks have asked for some of those messages that are in there on Hop from the Preacher's Mound. And this is one of them, The Silence of God... It's one of those messages that is in that series. Yesterday morning, the Lord told me to begin to speak on this again and add another scripture to it. And he showed me the scripture. So tonight, I'm going to share for a few minutes on part two of the silence of God. Psalm chapter 50, verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to tell of my statutes? and to take my covenant in your mouth. For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you associate with adulterers. You let your mouth loose in evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought that I was just like you, 
I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. Verse 21, these things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you, saith the Lord, and state the case in order before your eyes. Now turn with me to Ecclesiastes, just a few pages over, to your right, those of you that are here tonight, and this is the first time to turn to these books, you're in a great place in the Bible. Chapter 8. Verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly... Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. Verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. The silence of God. There are many here tonight that are questioning the very existence of God. You may be listening from cassette in your automobile, or you may be watching this video at home, or you may be watching the TV program in times like these. There are many that are listening that are questioning the very existence of God. Because, this is the reason, because of his apparent absence in your life, you are beginning to wonder if he even exists. You haven't felt his presence. You seem to be in control of your own destiny. You can't see his hand in your affairs. If he's out there, he's being awfully quiet. He's being silent. At times, you feel like a ship on a vast ocean left alone to battle the raging sea. God is nowhere around to be found. Perhaps you can remember a time in your life when you heard the voice of God, you followed his commands, you lived under his authority, you listened to his instructions, but for some reason you have drifted away. And now you can't seem to decipher his voice. Your life is like a radio that's not tuned in to just one channel. You're picking up a lot of static bits and pieces of stations here and there. Basically, it's just a bunch of noise. Perhaps you can relate to the psalmist who said in Psalm 55, 19, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. Now, everyone stay with me for the next few minutes. This is not a twinky message. This is not a Krispy Kreme filled donut message. This is Brussels sprouts. This is broccoli. This is asparagus. These are vegetables and they're good for you. Amen? I'm not mad at anybody, I love everybody. But in this revival, I have preached on the love of God the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the judgment of God. A loving Savior will one day be a severe judge. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. The wicked feel like that because there's nothing really going on in their lives. They can't see the hand of God stopping them from doing evil. Many of you know parishioners like that. You know they're not living for God, but there doesn't seem to be a judgment on their lives. It seems like everything's going okay. I can mention a few people that I know personally that are living in sin. They go to church, but their businesses seem to be flourishing. And because there are no changes, they've lost their fear of God. Dear Lord, bring the changes. Bring the changes. Right now, friend, many of you 
are experiencing the silence of God. There is so much to be said in this subject. We could speak night after night. I could speak tonight to the Christians about God's apparent disregard to your prayerful peti petitions. Many of you have been praying and it seems like God is not listening to you. You've been asking God to meet a need and you've received absolutely no response. Just remember, friend, the old adage, his delays are not necessarily his denials. Christians who love God that are listening to me tonight and you're living for him, you love him and you're living for him, I want to give you a scripture. He said this in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always. You want to know what that word always means? Always. That's what it means. It means exactly what he says. He hasn't left you. You might not be experiencing his noise, but because he's silent doesn't mean he's not watching over you and he cares for what's happening to you. He promised you he would be with you. Now I'm speaking to those that are holy. If you want him to leave, get nasty. Get unholy. You want your prayers to be unanswered get unholy. But tonight I want to expound on verse 21 of Psalm 50 and verse 11 in chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes. I want to cover two areas, no more, on God's silence. Listen up carefully. When God is not making noise in your life, there could be incredible dangers lurking. When God is not making noise in your life, when you can't sense him doing something in your life, that is not necessarily a sign that things are okay. Things could be horrendous. Things could be horrible. Something could be about to happen. Stay with me. I'm going to tell you about what his silence does mean and what it doesn't mean. First of all, what his silence doesn't mean. His silence doesn't mean that he is thinking like you. The Bible says here, because God is silent, because he's not doing anything, then he must be thinking like us. That's what these scriptures say. Because he's not coming down on us, then he must be thinking like me. You can go, friend, to the bars in Pensacola at this very minute, and you can talk to some people there, friend, sitting around drinking their Bloody Marys, and they will tell you about God. They'll tell you, I got a good job, got a great family. My kids love me, we got a boat. We go fishing, my son and I, every Saturday. On Sunday, we go to church. Everything is fine with us. Because he is silent, because he has not come down in judgment, they think that he is thinking like them, that everything is okay. Does this make sense to anybody in here but me? Stay with me. Listen carefully. Everybody, God is not thinking like you. Never has, never will. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. He does not think like you. This is such a powerful scripture. The Bible shines a light on every area of our life. It exposes like an intense halogen light. It cuts like a razor knife, friends. And this scripture eats me alive when I see this because I have been there. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he's conformed to your way of thinking. Here in this sanctuary, many of you have fallen for this lie. Let me explain. How do men think when it comes to spiritual things? First of all, men are incredible actors. Now, pastors, this is going to hurt some of us in this room, but I'm going to tell you what preaching the word is like sometimes. It's like surgery. You come before the doctor, and before they ever cut you with that knife, He's going to poke you. He's going to put you under the x-ray, and he's going to say, does that hurt? Does that hurt? Does that hurt? Does that... Ow! Mm-hmm. There's something right there. God does not want to hurt you. He wants to heal you. But sometimes the hurt comes first. 
every one of us that has a scar where something was removed from your body, a tumor, or you were shot. We've had several people come into this building that have been in gunfights and things where bullets have been removed from them. That didn't feel good when that bullet went in and when it was removed, but afterwards, they were a whole lot better. They, got, they were glad they had the bullet removed and they can see the scar on their arm or on their stomach where that bullet came out as a reminder of a healed wound. God does not want to hurt you. He wants to heal you. But men are incredible actors. They are masters at hiding their sins from other men. Therefore, they think they have also succeeded at hiding them from God. You want a test of this, friends? Go to your district meetings. Go to your general councils. I'm talking about the Baptists, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, the Catholics, the Assemblies of God. Go to these universal meetings that we have and watch the play acting. Watch what's going on, man. We are master actors in front of one another. Read this psalm and you'll see a group of people who are all wrapped up in ritualistic, religious exercises. They were cloaked in religious garb, acting out their parts. They would win an Oscar for their performance, but God hasn't even seen the movie. He's not thinking like men. He hasn't come to watch you perform. So what if you're arrayed in white and the world marvels at your appearance when inside you are full of dead men's bones? Friends, you haven't hid anything from God. He doesn't think like you. Someone can walk up to you and pat you on the back, offer words of adoration and praise. Boy, Billy, you are such an example to me. But deep down inside, friend, you know where you're at. Pastor Daniels, what an incredible message you preached this morning. You're my kind of preacher. Even the altars could be full. People would be saved. People would fall under the power. But there's still something going on inside. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody? But this whole time, God is silent. That's scary. That is scary, friend. Solomon said it so well. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly. People go on their way. I wasn't busted, man. I wasn't popped. God didn't get me for that. Some of you here committed a sin seven or eight years ago. Maybe you fondled a child. Maybe you committed adultery. Maybe you did this, maybe you did that, and time's gone by. No major judgment. Same thing, everything seems to be okay. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Friend. God's keeping silent. But stay with me for a few minutes. Some of you here that have never known the Lord, you've never known God, you sin over and over. It was first when you first started sinning and going wrong. You know, you remember it, you felt funny, you felt bad when you started to sin, you did something wrong. Girls, you lost your virginity. Guys, you lost your virginity. You felt bad, but you got over that. Why? You did not feel the judgment. You did not feel the hand of God coming on you. But what you did feel is more caressing from other men, more love from your friends, a little, a little more, more parties, more fellowship with the same folks that are doing the same thing. You did not feel the hand of God. The sentence was not executed quickly like it was with Ananias and Sapphira. That was executed immediately. Those of you that have never read that scripture, they died because they lied to God. Tonight when I give this altar call, don't anybody lie. I'm praying for that gift to enter the church again. And I'm not saying this in a jokingly way. Pastors, we pray that we'd have all the gifts of the early church. How come you skip that one? Why did you skip that one? Lie to God and die. Why? Because half your membership would hit the ground. But fear spread throughout the land when that happened. And the church grew. 
I believe that was a divine appointment, friend. God was taking care of that early church at the very beginning. He was saying, don't you touch them. That needs to happen in America. People need to look at the church in America and say, listen, go play at that club, go play at that club, go join that cult, go do that, go get involved in that religion. Don't get close to them. They're Christians. And they're on fire. You walk in that place, the fire of God will get you, man. You walk in that place, you'll be burned alive by the fire of God. If you want to repent and come clean, go there. But if you're playing games, don't get around that church. They're holy. They're on fire. They'll melt you in a minute. Don't get around them. You can be judged as holy by the sons of men and still be judged by but judge the heathen by the Son of God. You can sing about heaven and still go to hell. You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can be praised for involvement in the works of God and spend eternity in the pits of hell. Is this the truth? Remember, men can hide their sins from one another. So often they think they're hiding them from God. You know, one of the things that I've seen, pastors, if I could just park on this just for a minute, is uh, turn with me back to this psalm just for a second here psalm 50 verse 19 you let your mouth loosen evil and your tongue frames deceit you sit and speak against your brother you slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. I've wept when I read that, pastors, because I want to tell you where I've been before. I have sat in tables at the General Council of the Assemblies of God around a, a dinner table at Bennigan's with a bunch of people that thought just like me. You ever been with folks like that? You sit together because you think alike. You got God all figured out. And then one of them says, you know what's going on over there in that certain place? That ain't God. And another one says, you're absolutely right, it ain't God. I know for sure it ain't God. Because I had a deacon go over there and he told me it wasn't God. Well, let me tell you another story. And, and here you go around that circle. Before you got it, before five minutes goes down, what happened? You pull God in that situation like he's thinking like you. You think he's thinking like you. He never went to Bennigan's, man. He never sat down with you. You're, you're damning yourself, friend. Who do you think you are to sit around there and go, well, we've got him figured out. God's with our little party. Let's go on back to the general council now. The psalmist warns about this. You think I'm thinking like you. It ain't that way at all, friend. He ain't thinking like you. How many times when you, when you want to know what's going on somewhere, you call up somebody and ask them their opinion? And they got their opinion from somebody else that gave them their opinion. Why? Because that's how we think, you know? This is a group of people that I really run with right here. Why? They think like you. That's what you wanted to hear. I tell folks about this revival. You want to know what's going on in the revival? Talk to one of these sinners that have been saved by grace. Talk to them about the revival. Don't come to some clown that came for an hour and left out. And they're out there, friend. I've been to the Brownsville Revival. Stay 30 minutes. I don't want none of that junk. 30 minutes. Boy, you stayed too long. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm working towards an end here. Careful. Another thing about the way, what, what isn't happening, what is silence doesn't mean, Men tend to be very lenient towards themselves, forgiving themselves quite easily. Therefore, we think God is also being very lenient towards us. We're lenient towards one another. I've heard so many people say, you've heard it too, pastors, God would never send a man to hell. God would never do anything like that. Why would you say that? Because you are very lenient when it comes to punishment. You just couldn't imagine something like eternal damnation. We're dealing with the Dr. Spock unspanked generation here, friend. A generation that can't imagine punishment. 
They think God is thinking like them. I was never spanked as a child. God would never spank me. God would never punish me. Do you think he would punish you? You weren't spanked as a child either. Good one to get around and ask that question. Why don't you get around somebody who was whipped? Why don't you get around somebody who was punished by a godly father? He might say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, get some of them folks in your conversation. We can't imagine a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, but did Jesus talk about it? We can't imagine eternal torment and suffering. Sinners in this place that don't know the Lord. There is a hell. There is a place when you die where you will burn. Everyone's going to live for eternity. It's just where is the question. I can't imagine eternal torment and suffering. So since you can't imagine it, therefore God won't do it. You are lenient towards offenses, therefore God will be lenient towards you. We live in an lenient society. Look at America. Everybody, they, they, they gawked at what took place and where was the, the place where the kid was king? Singapore. This country went berserko. Should they cane him, should they not? Should they cane him, should they not? Should they cane him, should they not? Why? Other countries were saying, shoot him. In the Old Testament, they would have said, stone him, kill him, take him to the market square and kill him. By the way, most of us would be dead. They killed rebellious kids. They stoned them, they killed them. Read it for yourself, it's in the book. They killed them for rebellion against parents, for that obstinance that some of you parents put up with all the time. You just drag them out and they killed you. A kid thought twice back then. <laughs> but our society, we griped and complained. There were polls taken across this nation. Call 1-900, man. Call this number with your yes or your no, whether you think it should be Cain or not be Cain. Why? We are the only society, friend, that will allow a cold-blooded murderer to be put in a hospital because he's pleading temporary insanity. Why? Because his daddy is a multi-millionaire and hired the top lawyer in the country and got him out with three years in a mental ward. And everyone knows he'll be out in a few months. A cold-blooded murderer. We're so lenient towards one another, we think God's going to be lenient towards us. Where else can a rapist spend a few years behind bars and then get let out again? Free as a bird. A hardened criminal can walk into court decked out in a silk suit, a, 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 a slick suit and a silk tie and a crocodile shoes. He can snowball the jury and get probation when in what he really deserves is life in the penitentiary. But this is our society. And because we think like this, we think God is thinking like this. Friends, I'm fixing to get to the meat of this, so stay with me. We're going to close. You know what a lot of us do? How our escape valve, our works, our works. I've done wrong, but don't forget, Father, I have an orphanage, and I minister to hundreds of kids. I'm head of toys for tots. I run the clothing drive at Christmas. Nobody gives more time to the Salvation Army than I do. Our church is more involved in missions than any church in the district. God, look at these works. What do we get again? We, once again, we begin thinking that God is thinking like us, that somehow all these works will pad that time of judgment. How many times have I heard a statement like this? God understands what you're going through. After all, Jim, you run a drug rehab center for drug addicts. You spend your life doing good. God understands the weak points in your life. He sees your pornography problem. He doesn't like it, but he's not going to condemn you for it. Jim, look at the work you're doing. Just because God is silent, men believe he has conformed to their way of thinking. Well, I'm going to close. He does it. It does not mean... Boy, it's early. It does not mean 
that he's not watching everything you do. Now, this is where it's going to hurt. He may not be speaking, but his eyes are watching everything you do. One of these nights, I'm going to preach on the eyes of the Lord. But he is watching everything you do. I preached a message here on God's legal system about the judgment that fell on Belshazzar. Thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting. Friend, God has been watching your every move. He is keeping a record of your actions. We love the scriptures that says every hair of our head is numbered. But we cringe at hearing Revelation 20. 11 through 15, it talks about books that are going to be opened. It talks about men who are going to be judged for the things that are written in the book. We don't like that. Maybe God's not talking right now to you. Maybe he's quiet because he's too busy writing. I don't know about you, but I'd rather God put his pencil down. <laughs> And talk to me. Friend, he's going to talk to you tonight. It doesn't mean that he's not watching you. I remember standing before a judge up in Huntsville, Alabama. And I had one of the top lawyers in the, in the state. Matter of fact, he played golf with the judge. And so I figured I had it made. I was up for four counts, felonies, sales of narcotics. I was going to the penitentiary, and, uh, but my, my lawyer said, Steve, I think I can get you off. And so I stood before this judge, and he came out. Judge came out. Everybody rose. I was all dressed up. I had my hair back in a ponytail, looked as clean as I could. He came out, and he says, the state of Alabama versus Steve Hill. Stephen Hill. Stephen Hill, are you present? I stood. Prosecuting attorney was there. My attorney was there to represent me well-known in the Madison County, well-known throughout northern Alabama for his judicial experience. And the judge called the prosecuting attorney up. This was a preliminary hearing before the major trial. Prosecuting attorney came in with eight and a half by 14 sheets of paper, about that thick. And uh, I watched him, and I was wondering what's written on that paper. See, I want to know what's written down up there, friend. I don't know about you. I want to know what's written down. I don't want anything to be a surprise. <laughs> I don't want no surprises. And he walks in with his sheet of paper. And he starts, the judge calls the prosecuting attorney up. And he flips over that page and he starts reading. And he says, on October 2nd, 1971, Steve Hill left his home at 6 a.m. in the morning. He was wearing blue jeans, a white T-shirt, white tennis shoes, Reeboks. He got in a blue Volkswagen and drove three miles to a Winn-Dixie parking lot, drove around to the back of the store where he met a green van. In the green van were three individuals. One was six foot tall, one was four foot nine. One, I mean, they just went down, and I was going, oh. And my, my lawyer came up to me, and he said, Steve, what are they talking about? And I said, we got to talk, man. <laughs> they had been watching me. They had been casing my life. You know what I'm talking about, Tony? They had been casing my life. They had been watching every step that I had taken. They had me nailed. They had photographs of the drug deal. They had everything. They had all the evidence they need to send me under the penitentiary. God is watching you. Remember, he can see through walls. What his silence does mean. And we're closing with this. I know I've said that several times, but I haven't preached long enough tonight, friends. This is pitiful. What his silence doesn't mean. What his silence does mean. It does mean tonight, there's hope for many of us in this room because his spirit has not left you. He's contending with you. He's dealing with you. Thank the Lord. Say that with me. Thank you, Lord. 
He's still dealing with us in the chapel. He is still dealing with us. What it does mean is that he is patient. I want everyone to lift their right hand and say, thank you, Jesus, for your patience. He's patient. Have you ever noticed the story of the prodigal son? The father let the son go. Why? He knew, man. You know, he was patient. He knew the child had to get out there and experience some stuff for himself. The father let him go. The Bible does not say he went running after him and tried to convince him to stay. I'll give you more. I'll do this. I'll do whatever you want if you'll just stay in the family. The man was patient. It would be a waste of time to go after his son. His son wasn't ready to listen. He is also, this means not only that God is patient, but it means that he is long-suffering. He can endure the pain of your rejection for longer than most of us can endure such treatment. The next thing he's doing is he's working out his plan. He's working out a plan. I want to tell you, friend, everyone within the sound of my voice, whether you're driving down I-10 right now listening by cassette, whether you're up in New York City listening, wherever you might be listening to this, God has a plan and you're part of it right now. This is all part of his plan. He's been patient. He's been long-suffering. But I want to tell you, friend, he's not thinking like you. He's been taking notes. He's been watching you. And listen, what is going to happen if you do not repent tonight? Verse 21 says, I will reprove you. I will break my silence. That's a promise. He will break his silence and let you know my mind, and I'll set them in order before my eyes. Verse 22, this is Psalm 50. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you to pieces and there be none to deliver. I will set them in order before my eyes. Listen, friend, this is a military phrase. Many of you pastors may have studied this. I love this right here. This is a military phrase. That means he will line up your transgressions like an army. Imagine this. You're standing. God's been silent. You've gotten away with it. You've gotten away with it. And suddenly, you hear this. And you look up, and there's an army of transgressions marching your way. Marching straight towards you. You see them coming. You can identify everything that you've done wrong. You see it all. The adulterous affair, the pornography, the witchcraft, the drugs, the drinking, the partying. It's all coming at you. The day you lost your virginity, the day you did this, the day you did that, it's marching towards you. He said, I will set them in order before you like an army. I don't know about you, but that scares me. Solomon said, there is a sentence that will be executed. You're going to get busted. You're going to get busted. Charity, I want you to come. I know you're listening. I just want you to come closer and listen. You're going to get busted. You're going to get, get popped. Look at me, everybody. Stand perfectly still and they won't look at you, Charity. I want to tell you, some of y'all, if someone, someone can blow their nose on the right-hand side of the church and 762 people will go. <laughs> and you wait. And you watch how they wipe their nose. <laughs> and some people even go. <laughs> you ever notice that in America? I went, I visited some countries with that, that, that. They'll throw up when they see you do that. They'll throw up when you do this too, friend. We go, like that. We look and see, you know, it's like we reward ourselves. We wipe and then we put it in our pocket. I had 
had one man come up to me and gag. He goes, Pastor, what are you doing? That is filth. I said, yeah, that's why I folded the hanky, put it in my pocket. So stand still. <laughs> but there will be a sentence. There will be a day of execution of that sentence. Look at me, everybody, everyone in the chapel. There is coming a day where you will be popped. You will be busted. I've been part several times of narcotics raids, and they're amazing, man. It's like we were all drug dealers, and we'd go on for months and months and months, and nothing ever happened. Rhonda, we were free, man. We were dealing our drugs. We were making our money. Everything was fine. And then one day, one day, I get up. I look out the door, it's a blue and white in front, a blue and white behind my house, dogs on the side with shotguns, men with shotguns and dogs, I mean friend, it's over. They come in and they go, Stephen Hill, we have three warrants for your arrest. We've been watching you, man. But I thought everything was okay because the cops kept silent. We think everything's okay because God has kept silent. No, friend, he is lining everything up against us and he will judge you. One day, there is a sentence. And Solomon said, it will not be well for you. <laughs> you know what that means? That means it will not be well for you. That's the opposite of it will be well for you. It's not be well. It's the opposite of that. It will not be well for you. That's like the police coming up to my door and going, Steve, this will not be well for you. They're not coming up and saying, Steve, is it your birthday? We've got a cake for you. No, it will not be well for you. Cuff me, shackle me, lead me out into the paddy wagon, off I go to jail. Well, friend, I hate to pop your bubble, but it's going to happen for you if you don't repent. The silence of God, he will break his silence and he'll come down heavy. Before Charity Sings Run to the Mercy Seat, I want to give you some good news. There was a man 2,000 years ago that got on our level. <laughs> today I was playing with my little girl, Kelsey. She took her first steps today. Oh, man, I tell you, I, parents, I don't know what you've, I love it, man. Now i got to hide all my books. <laughs> now she's a roving maniac, man. Before she was in that little demonic walker, you know. And I could put furniture around with that thing, but now she can get around it, man. And I got all these old leather books, you know, and she can get to them now and rip a $400 book to shreds. She eats paper. She does. She eats. She'll rip out a newspaper. She'll eat it, chew it up. But today, I, got, I laid on the floor, and I got on Kelsey's level. And we just had a love affair, man, just loving, daddy loving on her. I said, give me a kiss, give me a kiss. And she'd kiss my lips. I'd give me another, give me another. And my mustache would always tickle her, you know. And she'd rub her nose like that. She'd give me another kiss. But we could have hung out all day because I got on her level. It's a different story when you're way up high. Hey. But when you're down there with her, loving on her, man, Jesus Christ got on your level 2,000 years ago. He came down. He came down. He came down, he came down. He got on your level, friend, and he said, I know what you're going through. I know the pain, I know the suffering. I'm dying for you, son. You're, there's coming a judgment, but I wanna tell you some good news. If you believe in me, 
If you'll come to me tonight and repent of your sins, I paid the price 2,000 years ago. I have gone to death row for you. I have died in the electric chair for you. I have been hung by the neck until dead for you. I have been crucified for you. I have died. I have paid the price. He paid the price for you, brother. Son, he paid the price for you, man. He paid the price for you. All that I preached on tonight about God breaking his silence. Tonight, he's broken his silence. You've been busted. You've been busted. But you want to know something? Why don't you just turn yourself in, man? Just turn yourself in. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Jesus, it's over. You've broken your silence in my life, God. I've been a fool to think everything is okay. Here's what I want to do tonight. I need the workers to help me over at the chapel. I want everyone in the chapel, look, look at me in the chapel. If you walk out of that building, look at me now, everybody look at me, don't move. If you walk out of that building, get in your car and drive off, woe be unto you. You get over here to this service. Get over here. I want you ushers, I want the ushers and the workers to get everyone in the chapel and bring them, line them up all inside here and open these doors right here. I want them all inside here for this altar call. <laughs> He's broken his silence. God's not going to be quiet no more. Friends, pastors, some of you that have been guilty, look at me, pastors. You've been guilty of getting in those little circles. Why don't you be the first one to leave? Don't do that no more, man. Because we get together, and you're going to get together with people that want to discuss this revival. I don't discuss this revival. I don't know anything about it. I've only been here ten and a half months. I haven't learned a thing, man. I really can't discuss the revival because I don't know what God's up to. It's far greater than anything we can imagine. I think he's going to sweep America with it. But I'm not going to sit down with folks and try to figure everything out. And for, for your own personal well-being, don't sit around with people that will curse this and curse that and not agree with this and not agree with that. Because before long, you'll think that God's thinking like you. And he's not. He's not thinking like you. Line them up all the way around. Now, there's a lot of folks that aren't going to be able to make it in here. Just come on in. Welcome. Just come and stand if you would. I don't want anyone looking around. I just want you to stay in, in reverence right now. Charity is going to sing us all called Run to the Mercy Seat. I'm going to give an altar call, but I want to explain this before everyone get, by, by, everyone's got to get in here first. I want everyone to look inward right now. Now, if you see somebody elderly walk in and you can get up, get up and give them your seat, okay? If there's someone elderly that they can't stand, give them your seat. Those of you in the back that are sitting down. But if not, I just plead with those that have come over from the chapel, if you just come in and, and just stand. Hallelujah. Boy, God is so good, friends. America is going to experience a touch of grace and mercy before judgment comes. You know that, don't you? It's coming. There's a famine in the land right now. It's a famine for truth. It's a famine for truth. The Bible says God will send the famine. Read in the book of Amos. He has sent the famine, and people are coming from far and wide. 
The Bible says they will come looking for the truth, not for bread, not for water. They're looking for the truth. And that's a sign for this nation that there is still hope. The Bible also says they will not find it. And in a lot of places, they ain't going to find it, friend. They didn't find it in Korsh's cult out in, Cal out in Texas. They followed him to a fiery grave. But that was a prophetic fulfillment when they went to his ministry. And by the way, in the government, it's all ministries. Korsh's ministry out in Waco. They followed him because they were hungry for the truth. Good people. Did you know that? Good people. They left their homes and family, came from all over the world to follow this man. Pastors, may God help you when they come into your church. These folks that are involved in this famine, when they come in, they get the truth. Let me share something else with you, pastors, as these folks are coming and look at me. When they come in, when you see new people come into your church, some of them, it took every ounce of energy they had to drag themselves through that foyer and to get inside your church. Don't choke them with a steak. Don't kill them with a steak. You've seen the old cowboy movies where a man's dying in the desert and a man will take a canteen up to him and just put it up to his lips and tip it and the guy will grab it and go, and he'll, he'll pull it away from him. Why? Because he'll choke. He'll choke and die if he drinks all that water so quick. Give them a dab of water on their tongue. Give them a little bit, let it moisten their lips and nurse them back to life, friend. Don't choke them. If they come into the church and they say stupid things, the dumb things, you know, they do some ignorant things. Man, they've been in a desert all their lives. Give them a chance, man, before you persecute them. Love these people. Some of these folks that are so ragged and messed up are going to be your deacons. And they will follow you everywhere you go, Pastor. They'll be your right-hand men and right-hand women. They'll be on your side if you'll stand with them at the beginning, if you'll nurse them back to life. This is going to be the awakening. Appreciate you folks coming over. Now I want everyone to stand. And we're not going to move any chairs yet. We're going to stay exactly where we're at. I don't want any confusion in this place. But here's what we're going to do. Some of you are away from God. Look at me, everybody. You are away from the Lord. Jesus Christ is not the center of your life. There are people that are listening right now, some of you at home, others by tape in your car, but there's a host of you right here that you do not know the Lord. Some of you have never known him in your life. I want to tell you, you were created to have fellowship with him. You were created to have intimate fellowship with your father, your heavenly father. You were created to live the life that I live now. I walk around all day long with Jesus. Everywhere I go, he's with me. If I go to Walmart, he's with me. If I go to the beach, Jesus is with me. By the way, man, go to secluded beaches. Don't tell me about your lust problem while you feed it. Go places where there's not a bunch of naked women running around. Take your family somewhere where they can enjoy the beach without daddy falling into sin or mama falling into sin. But some of you have never known the Lord. Tonight, you need to come to know him. He wants to be your best friend. Others of you have backslid. You've lost your spiritual appetite. You are away from God and you know it. Tonight, don't lie to God. Don't stand here tonight. He has broken his silence. He's calling your name. He's saying, son, would you listen to me one last time? I'm trying to bring you home. I'm trying to heal you. Would you let me heal you? Don't stand there. In your rebellion, the Bible says, the rebellious man will dwell in dry land. You deserve for the buzzards to eat your flesh. You're going to live out in that desert until you come and drink from the springs. 
There's others of you. You're backslid, you've been away from God for a long time. There's others of you that are in the ministry here. And you may think, well, this doesn't apply to me. Friend, you better start making it apply. If you're in sin, you know it. You need to come to Jesus. Had, I've had, we've had 25 pastors saved in this revival just on weeknights. We've had them baptized in the baptismal pool. Pastors that have come back to Jesus, some that had major works going on. Why? They realized they left them years ago. Because we're professionals, men, women. We're professionals. Some of us would do great in the secular world. Matter of fact, I know a man that fell into adultery, and now he's a major speaker around the country speaking for a product. He sells the product. Why? He's a great preacher, man. He can just put a, you know, product in his hand, just like he used to do the Bible. Major success on his way to being a millionaire. Why? He's a professional. He was a professional in the pulpit. You need the Lord, friend. I'm going to give this altar call, and here's what we're going to do. Everyone listen. Look at me. Don't let anything distract you. Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. If you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, you need Jesus Christ to deal with that area in your life. You're away from the Lord and you know it. This is not a time for discussion. This is not a time for you to turn to your neighbor and say, I will if you will. This is a time for you to look inside and go, God, it stinks. It's dirty. I hate what I see. God wants to work in your heart right now, friend. But this ain't the buddy system. This is not where you go to your mate and you go, well, you know, let's both go on down there and just, you know. Like, no, friend, why don't you step out? Why don't you step out? Maybe your friend will step out when you step out. Need to give your heart to God. But I'm a member of the Methodist Church. I'm a member of the Baptist Church. The other night, a deacon of a major Baptist church in the area got saved. I mean, he got saved, friend. Hello? He got saved. He was away from God, been away from God for years. He got saved. Miraculously saved. Don't hide under this cloak. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he ain't watching you, friend. He's brought you here right now. Don't anyone lie during this altar call? Well, why do I have to come down there, Steve? Let me ask you this. Why don't you want to come down here? Are you ashamed? Are you ashamed of him? Is pride holding you back? What is it, friend? Are you ashamed of the Lord? He hung on the cross nude for you. Naked. Those little pictures you see of a loincloth, friend, that's because artists can't paint what he really did. They made his face pretty. You want to know why? Those pictures would not sell if they really painted what he really looked like. You couldn't hang them in your foyer, I promise you that. So he hung up there in front of the God in the world and you can't step out of your seat, come down here and repent. I want to tell you, friend, you're worthless. That's why you never stand for God. That's why nothing's ever going to happen in your life. This is not a time to procrastinate. This is not a time to wait. This is a time to act right now. Right now is a time to act. As soon as charity begins singing, run to the mercy seat, everyone in this room, you need Jesus Christ to come into your life. You need Jesus Christ to forgive you. You need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away. You come as quickly as you can. God has broken his silence tonight. You are going to ward off the judgment to come if you deal with it now. Charity, I want you to sing this with all of your heart. Step out right now. I need Jesus Christ to forgive me. Come on, right now. Come on, hurry up. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Right now. Hooray. Hooray. Let's go. I need the Lord. Let's go. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on. Come on. Come on. I need Jesus. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Come on. Yes.
If you pray, if you play the song, there's not a friend. There's not a friend like my lowly Jesus. Everyone at the altar, there's a lot of repentance going on here, friend, but I want to tell you. As a matter of fact, where's my man with the shofar? Where you at, brother? Come here. Bring, the, bring your instrument. Look at me, everybody. I'm going to have him play this, Linda. Look at me, everybody. Down near the altar. Oh, stay where you're at. Don't look at me. Down at the altar. I'm sorry. Every one of you out in the congregation. There is an urgency in my voice because time is not as you know it. Time is passing quickly. The Bible says your life is a shadow. Listen, friend. The Bible says your life is a dream. It's a shadow. It's a cloud that vanishes. It's a flower that dies. It's the grass that withers. It's a vapor. It's mere breath. It's as nothing. It's a phantom. It's a sigh. Oh, that's your life. Oh. That's all it is in the space of time, in the span of time, friend. There is no more time for you. Amen. There is no more time. Yes, there is no more time. This is it right now. I'm going to have him play this shofar because there's going to be a trumpet that blows pretty soon. There's going to be a trumpet. Look at me. Some of you are sitting there going, well, man, I got all the time in the world. Did you know he's coming back? When he comes back, it's going to be over. And it might be tonight. It might be tonight, friend. The salvation message is being preached at an incredibly accelerated rate right now all over the world. He might come back tonight. I want you to listen to this, and then I'm going to give you one more opportunity. This is what you might hear. Go ahead. 
You come to him tonight. Step out. Come to him now. Get up and come. Get up and come. Get up and come. Get up and come. Now. 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 Yes. Yes. Come on. Get up. Yes. Come on. Come on. Yes, girl. Come on. Come on, right here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Do it again. Do it again. Get up and come right now. God's dealing with your heart. God's dealing with your heart. It's going to happen as sure as we're standing here. It's going to happen. Get up. Come on. Get right with the Lord. It's going to stop just like that. But just a little bit more, Gabriel! No. It's over. The judgment's going to be executed. That's really the way it's going to work, friends. Amen. And America needs to hear that. Yes. It's time. Now we're going to give you one more opportunity to repent. The singers, I want you to come up. Everyone in this room, you're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to ask them if they need forgiveness. Don't do this yet. Now, pastors, don't just because there's a pastor standing next to you dressed well tonight doesn't mean everything's sparkling clean inside. You're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to ask them, do you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away? Do you need to be forgiven tonight? Nobody lie in this building. If there's something inside of you, friend, that it's, it's, it's separated you from the Lord, this is it for you, okay? This is it. God's trying to love on you. God's trying to love you. He's trying to kiss you. He's trying to kiss you, friend. He's trying to kiss you. He's trying to be your friend. He wants to forgive you. But just come in a day, as you continue to stay in your, your position, you're standing against him. He will drop his hand of mercy and raise a sword of judgment. It'll happen. You turn to that person, you're going to ask them if they need forgiveness. Don't you lie. You say yes or no. I need Jesus Christ to wash my sins away. I'm talking about those of you that need God. You need to come back to God tonight. And you know it. Everybody's going to do this. And then both of you are going to come down here together. You're going to both come down here together to this altar. Now, pastors, look at me. We have had some of the most dramatic conversions during this time right yes, now. Amen. I want to tell you why. I mean dramatic. We've had major drug dealers saved during this time right now. Why? They were sitting back there. They've never seen anything like this in their life. But somebody turned to them and said, hey, man, how about it? You need Jesus Christ to forgive you? Yeah, I do, man. And they both came. And now it's months later. He's still on fire for God. He was forgiven mightily because somebody turned to him and cared. Everyone's going to do this. And both of you come down. Both of you come down. Everyone do it. Ask that person if they need forgiveness. Then both of you come down right now. Do it. All over the balcony. Up and down. Come on. Let's go now. Thank you. Come on now. Come on. Come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, yes, come on down, come on, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, come on, yes, thank you, Lord, look at this, Jesus knows all about us, come on,
what we're seeing here. You got to see, man. We're watching it with our own eyes right here. People are coming back to Jesus. People are being saved for the first time down here. People were brought by a loved one. People were brought by a friend at work. Come on. You need the Lord. Let's go. Let's go. Sing it one more time, Linda. Jesus wants to love you. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. And there's no night so dark that his love can't cheer us. Thank you, Lord. No, everybody that wants prayer. But listen, look at me, everybody. Those at the altar, don't look this way. Friends, some of you are going to go home tonight. You're going to lay your head on that pillow, whether it be a hotel, you're visiting from a long, long way off, or you're going to go home. You're going to lay your head on that pillow. You know what you're going to do? You're going to go, I wish. Why didn't I go forward? Why didn't I deal with the sin in my heart? Hear me now. You're going to do it. Why go through that? One lady went home and she called the church the next day. She said, can I still give my life to Jesus? I've been up all night. God bless you, sir. This right here. I know we're crammed in here, but we're just crammed in here. That's just the way it is. This is the banker that came to get his wife out of the revival. Hallelujah. God got a hold of this man like Saul of Tarsus. Has totally transformed him. What does Jesus mean to you now, brother? He's my life. He's my breath. I was a sinner, but I had, I had the breath to come in here and get saved so I can see what heaven is like. <laughs> That'll do. Now, you want to know a transformed man, you want to talk to Joanne, his wife. They are beside themselves, man. They got a new daddy, new father, new husband. Everything's brand new, friend. Everything's brand new. Just think a few months ago, a God hater, a drinker, a cusser. Now he's in here, got one of them mauve coats on. He's an usher. Yes, Lord. There are still some of you that need to repent. Repent means to change. It means to turn around. You're going to come down here and repent. I'm going to give you 60 seconds, and then we're going to pray. Your time will be up. Your time will be up. Now, we're, a lot of folks are in the aisles. Y'all squeeze in there somehow, so get, get out of the aisles. No music, no anything right now. I'm giving you 60 seconds from right now to get down here. Come on. God's dealing with your heart. 55 seconds. 50 seconds. Come on. 
God's dealing with your heart. 45 seconds. She just blew 15 seconds, friend. Come on. God's dealing with your heart. 40 seconds. 35. 30. Step out right now. You need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away. What are you waiting on, friend? 20. 20. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Yes. Come on. Come on. 10. 9. Yes. God bless you. 8. 7. 6. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. I want everyone at the altar to bow your heads. We have pastors here at this altar. Thank God. We have ministers here. Thank God. We have a lot of folks. You don't have badges on. You're not part of the pastor's conference. You came here tonight because you're one of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds that come for the first time to these revival meetings every night. And you came here. I'm watching some of you repent right now. I want to tell you, you are loving on God, and He's loving on you. You are blessing the Lord. He's been waiting for you. He's broken His silence, and you have too, man. You're finally talking. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You're finally talking. Some of you are coming to Jesus for the first time. Others have never, ever, you've, you've never known the Lord. Others are backslidden. You're coming back. We're all going to pray the same prayer tonight at this altar. I want you all to bow, close your eyes, and pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Jesus, once again, dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for breaking your silence, for speaking to me, for loving me. Tonight, Lord, I repent. I ask forgiveness. God. Wash my sins away. I just felt that, friends. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me. Wash me clean. Make me new. Tonight, Lord, I give you my life. 100%. All things are passed away. Everything has become new. From this moment on, you are my Savior. My Lord, my Lord and my very best friend. Very best friend. From this moment on, this moment I am yours I and you are mine. You are mine. Live your life, Live your life through, me. through me in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God brought you guys here tonight. You know that. I want everyone at the altar, if you would, just to stand right now. Stand. Everyone at the altar. I don't want anyone to leave this altar area right now. Workers, we have a lot of our workers here. I want you to come move through this group right here. I don't want anyone to leave this altar area. We want to pray with you. Workers, I want to make sure you talk to every single person at this altar. Pastors, if you're here visiting at this revival, and God has just done a work in your heart, and he's washed you clean. Some of you got to go make things right with some people. Okay, do that, all right? Do that. But our workers want to pray with you tonight. We want to pray with you. We're going to pray with everyone that wants prayer in this evening service. Pastor's up and around tonight. Aren't you going to pray with me tonight, brother? Hallelujah. We'll pray with you. But right now, we want to spend a few minutes talking to you, workers. There's a lot of folks, there's hundreds of folks here without badges on. I want to make sure 
that you talk to everyone that's come. Don't anyone leave this area. There's three things I want to share with you before we pray with you. One is this. Come to this revival meeting as much as you can. I talked to a young lady and a, a young man. Dan, are you here? Dan and Stephanie. God bless you, man. Where's Stephanie at? Stephanie, honey, where are you at? Wave at me. You're Dan's fiance, aren't you? I know y'all live in Fort Walton. But God is, beat, God is trying to work on this man, you know that. And Satan is beating him up. Y'all come to this meeting as much as you can. I know you're tired. But even if you got to come, just one or two of them a week. And even if, you know, if you got to get here late, just come. And, and let us pray with you. Get in his presence. Every one of you come to as many meetings as you can. You'll grow in the Lord. Number two, get involved in a strong local church. Our workers will help you find a strong local church. If you're a Methodist, we got some Methodist churches that are on fire. Yeah? We got some Baptist churches that are on fire. We got Episcopalians that work in this revival meeting, friend. They love God. They preach the word in their church. Presbyterians that preach the word. Go to a church that preaches the book. We'll help you. If you don't have any earthly idea where to come, you're welcome to come to Brownsville. But this is not about building Brownsville. Go to Dan Livingston's church. Stand up, Dan. Powerful man of God. Powerful church. First assembly over by Court of Mall. Go to his church. We have pastors all through here that work with this revival. Get involved in a strong local church. And the last thing is, be baptized. Be baptized. Look at me, everybody. Be baptized. Water immersion. Whoosh, under the water. If you were baptized as a baby and you've lived in sin for years, it ain't going to take. It didn't work. Okay? Be baptized. If you were baptized as a teenager, and you've lived in sin since then. You've fallen away from God. Be baptized. Tomorrow night, we're going to have a baptism here. We sign up the first 25 people. Tell our worker you want to be baptized here tomorrow night. And, and give the devil a black eye, man. Show the world I'm dying to the old man coming up in newness of life. Hallelujah. I want every one of you to remain where you're at. Workers, you're going to have to work quickly. You may have to speak to several people at the same time. And I want you to work first. Speak first to the ones that do not have the badges, okay? God bless you. Everyone turn around. Don't, don't leave this area until someone speaks with you. Living.